Okay, Jeff, we are live and recording. Okay. Shall we get started? Welcome, everybody. Um, thanks for joining me. Um, thanks for coming to uh, SFAR's Member Appreciation Day. So um, if you are here, then we are here to talk about landlord-tenant law in San Francisco, and in particular how it's changed with with COVID. Um, you'll see on your screen that there's not only a chat, but there's a Q&A. Um, so if you, during this presentation, have questions that, uh, of me, particularly ones to clarify what I'm uh, presenting to you, then uh, please type it into the Q&A. Um, Esther is going to then uh, let me know that there's a question uh, having to do with clarification, and then I will address it right away because I want to make sure that we're all on the same page. Um, and I'm going to leave time at the end uh, for us to um, talk and at, you know to answer your questions. And so you can put those on the Q&A as well, and I'll just read them off to everybody and, and, uh, and try to answer them as best I can. Um, this format is uh, obviously uh, less new, but still a little bit new for everybody um, in that I don't uh, get to talk with you and I don't get to see you. Uh, and so the chat is going to be an important way for us to connect. And so please feel free to use it. Um, so the first thing we're going to talk about is eviction moratorium. Um, as you know, uh, the pandemic really became um, uh, swept the country, swept the swept the state, swept our city uh, and shelter in place orders were issued. And uh, both at the local and the state level, eviction moratoriums were um, enacted. And so what I want to do now is to talk to you about what the present state of the moratoriums are, because uh, while we could go through the history, the confusing history, it, it doesn't really help us to know any of that. Uh, what's important is to know what's going on right now. Um, so let me start with San Francisco. So in San Francisco right now, uh, there is an eviction moratorium having to do with uh, non-payment of rent uh, evictions. Those were preempted by a, a, a state law that passed about three weeks ago that I will be telling you about in a second. But uh, the sum of it is that there is currently a uh, statewide eviction moratorium for non-payment of rent through the end of uh, through the end of January. Um, what about all the other kinds of evictions in San Francisco? Um, they were pre they were, excuse me, there was a moratorium uh, on all evictions except for um, the Ellis Act and uh, for cases which involve health and safety. Um, that uh, was about to expire um, and the Board of Supervisors has just passed uh, like a week ago a, a sweeping new legislation that essentially extends the eviction moratorium through the end of March. Now that has not been signed into law yet, but we fully expect that it will because 100% of, of the supervisors have, have uh, voted for it uh, on the first reading. I'm not sure that it's gone through the second reading yet, but all indications are that when it does, it will again pass 11 to zero the mayor will sign it and it will go into effect sometime in November. Um, what that legislation does, again, is it, it restricts all evictions except the Ellis Act or those having to do with health and safety. It does not include uh, non-payment of rent cases because those are separately handled through uh, the state moratorium, which we'll talk about more in detail in a little bit. And so what does that mean for us? Well, uh, a lot of things. Uh, one of the big things is that we can't do owner move-in evictions now uh, until the end of March. Um, so we would be serving notices sometime in the first week of February so that they would expire at the uh, after the end of March into the first week of April, and then we could begin an eviction uh, then. Um, uh, like I said, it doesn't ex include Ellis Act evictions, so we can start those now. The notice period on Ellis Acts is 120 days unless there's a claim of disability um, or, or the tenant is elderly, meaning 62 or older. And uh, if that's the case, then the notice period would extend to one year. And so we're going to be well beyond any of these dates I've given you at any rate. Um, 
Health and safety is the interesting exclusion. Uh, this derives from the state uh, emergency order. But the interesting thing about it is that every county deals with it in a different way. Um, in San Francisco, we only have anec anecdotes as to the way the city has uh, been working with this term uh, health and safety. So as a practice, what happens is if we want to file, let's say someone is doing something dangerous, um, having wild parties on top of the roof, um, what we would do is we would serve a three-day notice for them to stop it, and they didn't stop it. Then we file an unlawful detainer, and the city would not issue a, a summons uh, for the for the lawsuit, and which means that it can't go forward. And we would then have to file uh, what's called an ex parte application with the court asking it to issue the summons, and it would be our burden to prove that it had to re that it related to health and safety. So anecdotally, I've heard in other cases where people have actually gotten restraining orders against tenants that the city will not, at least at that time, the court would not issue uh, the summons. Um, and, and that probably reflects uh, a desire to prevent homelessness during a time of pandemic. Anyway, I'm, I'm not here to make excuses for the court. That's just my guess, but that's probably what I think is going on. And in so doing, um, if the court does not agree, then the case can't go forward. And that's sort of the gatekeeper uh, for that. Um, California's law. So California, as I said, passed sort of a sweeping um, eviction moratorium related solely to residential uh, non-payment of rent evictions. Um, what it does is it says that if there's any rent due from the period March 1st, 2020, through January 31st, 2021, you can't begin an eviction to recover that money. Um, there is a notice that you can serve a tenant beginning now and some weeks ago, which uh, would require the tenant to pay 25% of the rent going forward. And if they fail to pay that 25% of the rent, then come February 1st, you could begin to evict them for uh, non-payment of that 25%. Assuming they paid the 25%, then you will not be able to evict the tenant for any rent due from that period. I described March 1st through January 31st. What you can do is you can file an, um, a, uh, a small claims action. Even if the amount of money is in the excess of $10,000, which is the normal jurisdictional limits, um, this new law allows you uh, to do small claims as a way of expediting it. What do you get in small claims? You get a money judgment. You get a piece of paper that says they owe it to you, uh, but you don't get possession of the property. Um, that piece of paper, that judgment that you'll get, there are different things that we can do for it. Uh, we can, uh, we can uh, garnish wages. If they have wages, we can uh, attach bank accounts, things like that. Um, a lot of the kind of things that in a normal time you would prefer not to do, that you would prefer to have the eviction because really what you want is the place back. Now, if they stop paying rent um, February 1st, um, we can do that. We, we, I mean, we can do an eviction. Uh, we can, then it rolls back to the way it used to be. Uh, in 2019, where we just serve an eviction at ours. Um, again, Jeff, we have a couple questions. When you, yeah. uh, um, there's a question that came in through the Q and A. Said, what can be done in a situation when an elderly protected tenant sent an email to the owner saying that he doesn't want anybody in his or her unit during the pandemic? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, that, so right now. And lawyers may vary uh, in terms of their advice, but it's my opinion that there that despite uh, the civil code allowing entry upon notice, that the local shelter in place order and the pandemic related orders do not allow any entry. Uh, and in fact, even if the tenant were to agree to allow you entry, there's still some risk to the owner in doing it because if um, if the tenant acquires uh, COVID-19 uh, after you've entered the premises, um, you could be a target for a lawsuit. Uh, I mean, it'd be their burden to prove it, but this is the whole, um, I think, growing what 
we're calling the pandemic or the COVID-19 jurisprudence. There's a whole new uh, set of facts that the law is now being applied to in light of the uh, pandemic. And and we're going to see a, a bunch of new cases come out that will start to shape potential liability. Um, where I've had clients interested in entering the premises for, let's say, very important repairs that were completely necessary. Um, you know, we've we've had to make arrangements for tenants to actually physically leave the premises and then to have a crew come in and do a cleanup just for risk management. And so that's the way I suggest that people do it. Um, so in addition to this new state law that um, that uh, covers non-payment of rent, and by the way, uh, CAR has a really great uh, summary that they publish. You can get it on their website. It's it's all set up in a sort of a Q and A form, it's, but it's well organized, um, easy to follow, and and you know uh, gives really good answers to questions. So I, I really recommend that you take a look, try to find that. Um, so there's one more question if, uh, that was sent through the chat. It's um, it's asking, what if a tenant moves out owing back rent specifically during COVID? Right. So you would still be uh, prevented from pursuing that money until after January 31st, uh, assuming that the rent was owed for a period for the period March 1st through uh, January 31st. Um, if they moved out, consider yourself lucky because at that point, then you can at least try to re-rent it. Um, the problem could have been much worse, but, uh, to answer the question, got to wait till January 31st, then you can file a small claims complaint. Um, and, and in addition to this new, uh, law, which is known as the, let's see, it's known as the COVID-19 Tenant Relief Protection Act of 2020. You'll, you'll recall that last year in, uh, 2019, AB 1482 passed. Um, what uh, this new law did was it also slightly amended uh, AB 1482. Um, it extended it to all properties uh, through the end of January 31st, uh, 2021. What does that mean? There used to be exemptions for single family homes, condominium units, uh, other uh, exemptions as well. None of the exemptions apply unless the owner is selling the property um, uh, to the buyer, uh, to a buyer and its owner occupied. That's not a very useful um, exemption for us. And in San Francisco, virtually every property in San Francisco is going to be in, uh, is going to be exempted from AB 1482, at least as to eviction controls. So I don't know that we need to worry about it. Um, but to the extent that you have some property that you or your client um, need to uh, deal with under AB 1482, there are only four reasons that you can evict a tenant without, uh, you can evict a tenant for just cause when they haven't done anything wrong, like not paid rent. Um, and there, one of them is owner move in. One of them is that city or some government agency is requiring the unit to be vacated because it's uninhabitable. One of the reasons is that you intend on demolishing or substantially remodeling the unit. And then the last reason is that you intend on withdrawing the unit from rental from the rental market. Um, at least as of today, uh, it's my considered advice to any landlord that if you're going to do an eviction under AB 1482, no matter what the real reason is, that you're going to use the withdrawal of unit uh, from the rental market as a grounds. Why? Well, one is it kind of sounds like the Ellis Act, right? But it's not. Um, it's very different than the Ellis Act because, for one thing, it only applies to the one unit that you're doing the eviction, not the whole building. Two is that there's no uh, statement in the law how long you have to keep it off the market. Um, now, can you do it and keep it off the market for one day and then re-rent? I don't think that would be smart, but there just isn't any case law to tell us. If you were going to take it off the market because you wanted to move a, a relative in or because you were wanting to sell the building and it was more attractive with that unit vacant, that would make sense. And then um, I think that likely you would be be fine in terms of potential liability from this tenant to sue later. But right now, that's the, the grounds for eviction for withdrawal is the one that's completely wide open.
and should be used. In fact, I can't imagine that in the coming year, the statute won't be again amended to create requirements under the withdrawal statute because it's just it's such an open door. So the next topic I want for us to talk about is buyouts. Um, buyouts um, are still going on during the pandemic. Um, in fact, um, in some ways, buyouts have become slightly easier in the pandemic because the rental market has taken such a drop. And so uh, the difference in rent between what tenants are paying and what uh, it would cost to re-rent has probably narrowed uh, substantially in some cases. And, you know, um, and that gives people more opportunity. They may be more willing to leave for maybe slightly less money because the differential is lower than it used to be. Um, and as you know, when you do a buyout in San Francisco, um, there is uh, a buyout ordinance that we have to comply with. Um, and that buyout ordinance does, among other things, have certain requirements. We have to serve tenants with a disclosure uh, before we begin talking to them. Uh, we also have to register with the rent board. And so once we've done all that, if we actually reach an agreement with uh, the tenants, then we have to write up an agreement that gives them at least a 45 day rescission period. And, uh, and then we have to file the, the, um, we have to file the buyout agreement with the rent board. Um, these requirements are still all in place, but there was one exclusion to the rent ordinance, uh, to the buyout ordinance that was a very important one. And that is that, um, if you were settling an unlawful detainer action, um, then, you were not considered a buyout. And that's great. Why? Because when we do a buyout, uh, it can affect condo rights. And as you know, there, there may not be many condo rights left, but for two unit buildings, this could be important. Um, right now, the condo lottery is still, um, is still, um, uh, it still doesn't exist. Uh, it's coming back at the end of, tw I think in 2024, unless, uh, there will be follow-up legislation to um, curtail it further, which I fully expect. Um, but if we do more than one buyout in a building, um, then we lose condo rights for 10 years. If we do one buyout, or we do two evictions in a building, then we lose buyout rights for 10 years. Um, and so, so we have to sort of play a game. And one thing about a buyout is that if we can avoid it being a buyout, but still getting the tenant to leave, then we've kind of saved our one free buyout. Um, and this, this exclusion was a very useful thing, particularly where tenants wanted to leave early before the 45 days. Um, if there was a 45 day rescission period and, uh, the tenant was willing to move out, uh, we have, was willing to move out like in, let's say a week. Uh, the problem was that they'd want to get paid. And if, and if you paid them and then they rescinded it, then you might have nothing. And that was going to be a problem. So um, what happened was earlier this year in April, um, there was a bill that, re, uh, that amended the buyout ordinance. And what it did was it said that if you um, file a lawsuit and settle the case, that that was still a buyout unless the, the time between you the, the, that unless that the time between when you first began negotiating and the time you filed the unlawful tainer was at least 120 days uh, otherwise it was then uh, be co would be considered a buyout and not a settlement of a lawsuit so um, your association of realtors the San Francisco apartment association the small property owners um, the the uh, Coalition for Better Housing all banded together. They filed a lawsuit and very happily they were successful. Um, and so the, that law has been struck down at the court level, uh, the trial court level. We don't know if the, um, if the city will appeal. Um, if they appeal, then uh, we'll have to figure out what's gonna happen, uh, obviously. It's unlike uh, it's unlikely that the court of appeals is going to change it, change the lower court's decision, but you just never know, and that's the problem. Rumors are that it's that the city may not appeal, 
Um, and of course, that would be great. They have 60 days to do it from, I think the decision came out about two weeks ago. It came out, uh, oh no, not that, you know, about October 8th is when the decision came out. So they got 60 days. Um, anyway, the rumor is they might not appeal because a lot of tenants didn't like this ordinance. They actually like the idea of an exempt buyout. Uh, why? Because sometimes they can negotiate more money for an exempt buyout. Um, it, it was. It also affected the uh, the willingness of landlords to settle cases in a in a way that might be generous for legitimate unlawful detainer cases because suddenly they would be uh, creating a buyout for their building when it was never intended. As an example, if you know you were in the middle of a buyout, excuse me, if you were in the middle of evicting someone for non-payment of rent, and uh, like 90% of the cases it's settled, and then suddenly your building gets tagged with having done a buyout. You know, that's something that was very unattractive. So um, so this new law passed um, and now we have to see what happens. Um, and we'll just have to keep our fingers crossed that the city doesn't appeal or if it does, that the Court of Appeals uh, does not overturn the lower court decision. Um, the next thing I want to talk to you about is buyouts is a provision. Uh, there was a new case that came down and it's kind of an interesting one. Uh, it's called Grayley versus Castro. Um, and in that case, uh, the, the landlord and the tenant, they entered into a settlement agreement. They, they went to, uh, they were being evicted. The tenant was being evicted for non-payment of rent and they entered into a settlement agreement. And why it's interesting is because what happened is they entered into a sort of a standard agreement where the tenant said that they were going to pay on a date certain. Uh, the back rent. And if they did, they get to stay. Uh, this is a very standard, what we call pay and stay kind of uh, agreement. But if they didn't pay, um, then the landlord could go to court and get a judgment against the tenant. Very, very standard. Um, something we see almost every day. Um, so anyway, they entered in this kind of agreement and, it, and of course, the tenant could not pay. Um, the tenant uh, uh, the tenant, um, excuse me, a tenant could not pay and a tenant, more importantly, uh, I'm sorry, let me back up. This agreement said that the tenant had to move out on a date certain. Okay. They didn't have to pay, but if they didn't move out, they would then have a judgment against them for money. And so what happened was that of course, when the day the tenant was supposed to move out, they, they had trouble moving out. And in fact, they were three hours late moving out from the date they were supposed to move out. The, the the landlord, um, probably not a nice guy, went forward with the court hearing saying, hey, they breached the agreement. They moved out three hours late. So I want you to enter judgment against them for all the back rent that they didn't pay. And the court did enter judgment. And so the court of and the and it was appealed and the court of appeals said, no, uh, we reverse this decision. Uh, why? Because interestingly, what the court said is that Entering into entering the judgment against these tenants for these thousands of dollars amounted to a penalty. And all of you are, I'm sure, very aware of um, the liquidated damages provision in in a standard real estate contract. And you'll 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 remember that it says that, well, damages are going to be hard to determine. Uh, and the parties agree that, you know, whatever, three percent of the sales price is a fair uh, and equitable um calculation of the damages. Uh, and so what that does is it prevents the prevents the owner from seeking more damages and it makes it very difficult for the buyer to argue that they should pay less damages. Um, and the benefit of that is it's quick and easy. And so based on this decision, we don't know now what's going to happen with uh, our standard stipulations. Um, most of them don't get breached. It's very, very rare that we see a stipulation for a tenant to move out, uh, for a tenant uh, when they enter into a deal uh, to breach the agreement. And, how, and how, why am I talking about it in terms of buyouts? Because typically in a buyout agreement, what we do is we say, okay, we're going to pay you whatever, $50,000. You get $25,000 after 45 days because we want you to not rescind the agreement. And then you get the balance, uh, uh, the $25,000 when you leave. And it specific says, if you don't leave on time, 
then we can enter judgment against you and we don't have to pay you the last twenty five thousand dollars. We're concerned now that this Gray Lee case is going to affect our ability to do that. Um, and that's important because that has always been a huge um, motivator for tenants to comply with the agreement. And we just don't know what's going to happen. Uh, we'll just have to wait and see. Uh, we are probably going to draft into our own agreements uh, liquidated damages clause uh, language uh, to say that if you don't leave, you're going to cause this damage and you agree that the payment is is not due. Uh, we think the Greeley uh, decision was wrong, I mean, on a lot of levels. Um, but I doubt that the Court of Appeal, uh, excuse me, the Supreme Court is going to take it up. And it's really unfortunate this landlord did what he did because he created a really set of lousy facts, right? Three hours difference. And suddenly he's just going to go after the judgment when he really got everything he wanted. He really wasn't damaged in any way. Um, by the time he filed the, the motion to have a judgment entered, the tenant had been gone already uh, long before that. So it's kind of an unfortunate case. Um, but uh, But something that is out there now as a published decision, and we're going to have to figure out how to integrate it in the way we, we do business with tenants nowadays. Um, the other thing I wanted to talk to you about was changes to the Ellis Act, and they're not direct changes. Um, they're changes in the way we use the Ellis Act and, and how we, we think about it. Uh, um, so as I said, there are no direct changes to the Ellis Act this year, uh, maybe next year, but this year, no. Um, uh, but what did pass is something called uh, Section 37.9F in the Rent Ordinance, uh, and which is entitled Circumvention of Tenant Protections, kind of interesting title. What that was uh, designed to do was to, it was designed to mm -hmm. mitigate what some tenant advocates thought, thought were abuses of people in doing the Ellis Act, and in particular, what it did was it created something called non-tenant uses, um, non and it disallowed these non-tenant uses. So one of the non-tenant uses uh, is uh, licenses. Uh, so what does that mean? Well, licenses is a really really broad category of people using property. Um, where it come? So maybe it's helpful to explain why we sometimes use the Ellis Act. So one of the reasons that Ellis Act is employed will often be because uh, an owner move in, even if the owner wants to move in, it doesn't fit. Uh, maybe the tenant is protected. Maybe uh, there it's a two unit building with a vacancy in the bottom, but the landlord wants the top unit because it's the nicer unit. Maybe they want to move a kid into their building and um, they want and, and do uh and they, they don't qualify for relative move-in and they don't want to do what we call a swinar relative move-in and they don't want to deed an interest to the child uh, because it will create a tax problem. There's lots of reasons why sometimes we use Ellis Act, even though an owner move-in might fit, uh, but doesn't fit really well. Uh, and when we do that, and let's say, let's say as an example, we have a single family home, tenant occupied, and uh, an owner wants to move their son in. Um, he's late 20s, early 30s, and, you know, as an adult with a job. Um, so in counseling him, uh, them, I would say, well, we could do the following. We could deed a 25% interest to your son, and then we he could do an owner move-in. So that's one option. We could uh, do what's called a swinar relative move-in, challenging the rule that the owner has to already live there because it's a single family home and that's impossible. And that could be viable, um, and that would not require the transfer of ownership. Um, and Or the third option is the Ellis Act. The Ellis Act says that we're not going to use the property as rental property. And so long as we don't charge the son any rent, then at least before this law passed, we would say that's something you can do. That works. Um, and often an Ellis Act would be what we would try, would try because the first option, deeding 25% interest to the son, um, has a problem. That is that um, the son would lose a step up in basis on the 25% if he was going to inherit that property anyway. So I know you all know about that and you understand that that could be a significant problem for them. Um, 
they could do the Swinar relative move in, but that is a constitutional challenge. And that could take almost as long as an Ellis Act and would create other problems like requiring the tenant, uh, excuse me, the son to live there for three years as his principal place of residence, um, which may or may not be what he wants to do. The Ellis Act is much more flexible. It just says that you can't use the property as rental property for five years. And for a lot of people, that makes sense. And they don't have to transfer to the son. But with this new law that disallows uh, licenses as a, a use, we don't know what we're going to do. Because if I let the son live there, if I'm the owner, essentially what I'm doing is I'm licensing him to do that. And under this new code, it's, it's a breach of the code. And we don't know how that's going to play out in terms of how the city enforces it, whether that will be a challenge uh, to the Ellis Act itself when we're fighting it. Um, so that's a that's a problem. And the only fix we have for it now, because we have some cases in the pipeline, is that the landlord, which is what they didn't want to do, is going to have to deed some interest to that child to move in. Maybe not 25 percent now. Maybe he's going to get a deed 5 percent. But as a 5% owner, he would have a right to live there. And so he wouldn't need to have a license to live there. And so we're hoping that that solves it, but it doesn't solve everything. Um, this is one of the problems with the new uh, law. And so I don't know how we're going to solve it. It's, it's going to be a problem. Um, I would love to take more questions if you have any, uh, everyone. So please go to your Q&A. Let me know if there's some questions you have or some situation that you've been working through that maybe I can answer. Um, uh, Jeff, there is a question that came in through the chat. Yeah, the question please. is, uh, uh, they just wanted to confirm so a landlord cannot evict tenants for non-payment of rent right now until January 31st, 2021. Yeah, that's, that's exactly right. And I know that that just seems like unbelievable, but that's that's the way the law works. In fact, um, uh, not not that probably many of you uh, are involved with this, but but it may be helpful information for you that there's a separate commercial uh, not or eviction moratorium for non-payment of rent in San Francisco, um, and it it's only um, it expires the end of November. And I I'm not sure why it's that way. I'm I'm a little surprised. Uh, Governor Newsom has signed um, uh, an extension of the of the order authorizing cities to implement a a, uh, uh, a moratorium on commercial eviction for non-payment of rent through the end of March. Um, and so, you know, it, it could be very well that the the mayor extends it, but why she hasn't already done it is is surprising to me. And so maybe, you know, maybe I'm just being uh, hopeful, but maybe that's um, a sign that she will not do that, or she may limit it. Um, there have been some other cities, uh, like in particular, I'm thinking of Sacramento, that have limited that uh, moratorium on commercial buildings to only um, uh, street level uh, spaces or uh, retail spaces. So may maybe she's considering something like that. But there's a follow-up question to that. The um, eviction moratorium, does that also apply to uh, roommates not being evictable. Yeah, so it, it does. It applies to all evictions. So e whether or not, um, and, and the, often the roommate situation can be distinguished uh, from a normal landlord tenant situation because there may be an exemption from the rent ordinance. Um, if either if it's a tenant with a roommate and, and the tenant was master tenant was smart enough to get the tenant to sign a sub agreement, which, which said that the, the rent ordinance, uh, the tenancy with the sub tenancy was exempt from the rent ordinance, then that would not, the rent orders would not apply. Or if a landlord which had a roommate and shared either bathroom or kitchen, that that would automatically be exempt. So the thing is that it doesn't matter whether it's exempt under the San Francisco's rent ordinance or not. Um, it would still uh, the it would still be uh, there's still a citywide moratorium on evictions whether the rent ordinance uh, uh, eviction control applies or not. Okay. The third clarifying question on that same one is is that this is for San Francisco only or is this anywhere else in California? So the it, it, so it's for San Francisco only. Um, the what I told you about 
non-payment of rent is statewide. So everything else is just San Francisco only. As an example, in San Mateo County, all of their uh, moratoriums expired already. Uh, the rent, the residential eviction expired in August 31st and the commercial expired back in May 31st of, of this year. And so the laws are completely different there. If we had a building and we had a property in San Mateo, what we'd be looking at is, is it a non-payment of rent related type eviction? If it is, then there is a statewide rule that applies. And if it's not, then we could evict. Uh, we could do an eviction in San Mateo County. Okay, there's a, a question. Can you speak about the seller license to use for a rent back? Anything to be wary of uh, with the eviction moratorium? Usually you, you give a, a free 30 day rent back, but have heard stories of issues around that. Yeah. Um, so even if we, if, listen, if we take away all of the pandemic problems that I just described to you, the seller rent back has always been for lawyers, um, something that is fraught with risk. Um, the standard license agreement that you get on zip forms says it's a license, um, but um, it's not clear that it is, uh, even if it says it is. In fact, I, I'm fairly confident that if that ever got challenged, that 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 buy, that seller would be considered a tenant for all intents and purposes because they have for, they meet certain um, tests like they have sole use of the property, exclusive use of the property. Uh, they've paid money for it or some sort of consideration. Um, and so when you add uh, and so what we've always been worried about, at least I've been worried about as a lawyer, is if, if, the, if the seller doesn't leave, what do we do? How can we get them out? And so we'd have to look at the just cause for evictions. And, and there isn't one for seller agreed to vacate after 30 days of close of escrow. Um, it's just like a lease expires. There is no, you know, they are, have a right to go month to month. Um, and so ways that we have uh, enacted to motivate a, a, a seller to leave timely is that we set a very, very large rent so that if they're staying, we can begin to evict them for non-payment of, of this very, very large rent. Um, and secondly, uh, holdbacks in escrow. Sometimes that can be done, sometimes uh, not. Sometimes you can get seller's degree, sometimes not. You know, we're still, I think, in a seller's market, so that may be tough, but those are the kind of techniques we've used. Now, if you layer on to that, all that I've been telling you about, about particularly San Francisco and its, its uh, coming eviction moratorium, we couldn't even start to do an eviction until the end of March uh, to get these sellers out, assuming we we're willing to do, as an example, an owner move in eviction. So um, there are problems. Uh, is the reality that this will always happen? I'm sure not. Um, I'm sure most sellers are going to leave, but um, that doesn't mean that there isn't legal vulnerability. And and so for your purposes as as realtors, I think what's important is disclosure. Um, so, uh, seller, a buyer has to understand the risk of doing the, the rent back. Okay. There's, um, a little more general question, um, uh, asking, can a teacher be evicted during the school year, during the Ellis Act, not specific during shelter in place and COVID? Yes. So the rule that, um, that, that person is asking about is um, is one of the restrictions for uh, against uh, doing an owner move in eviction. Um, so if you're doing an owner move in eviction and they have a school age child, then you can't do it to the summer months. And that rule was expanded about two years ago to now include uh, or if any member of the household was a employee of the San Francisco Unified School District. And so that doesn't mean they're a teacher. They could be a janitor. Uh, working for the San Francisco Unified School, you can evict them until the summer months. Um, and so, uh, and the summer months are determined by San Francisco Unified School District. Um, you can look up their, their calendar and you can find the last day of class, which is usually some day, the first week of June. And then, uh, and then the, the first day of class for the fall semester will be sometime mid-August. So it gives us a very narrow band where we would have to serve a 60-day notice uh, 
and it has to expire between those two dates. Um, and so that's why we might consider as an alternative the Ellis Act, uh, because it might take a year anyway, and it might be simpler. But uh, but yes, it does uh, it does apply to teachers. Okay, another question's come up. Uh, what if the master tenant moves out and the subtenant refuses to leave and not pay rent? Will the master tenant need to evict after January 31st? Uh, I think assuming the master tenant lives out of state. So I think in this hypothetical, uh, or maybe it's not hypothetical, maybe it's real. I, I can't imagine that the master tenant cares and is just, it's, it's just he's left and he's not going to do anything. And so really what I would be focusing in on in this question is what can the landlord do when the master tenant has vacated and the subtenant and he's left the subtenant and nobody's paying rent. So uh, if we add the COVID problems in, then we can't do anything until um, until February 1st. Um, and we could serve a notice. And if someone doesn't pay 25 percent, then we can begin an eviction on on February 1st for the 25 percent. If nobody pay, if they pay the 25 percent, then we could seek a judgment. Um, we could also um, serve a notice terminating the tenancy. Uh, because it's an unapproved holdover subtenant, assuming we've never accepted rent from the subtenant. But again, we can't begin the eviction until um, February 1st. Um, and so that's the dynamic of it. And I have actually a couple of cases like that already. And that's and all you can do is wait or negotiate to get them out. So I think the follow up to that is the master tenant responsible for all the back rent. So I think arguably you I would take the position on behalf on behalf of the landlord that, yes, that while you have vacated, that doesn't mean that your liability is ongoing because you left a subtenant. Right. And so come January 31st or February 1st, you could sue in small claims court this master tenant for the balance uh, of all that unpaid rent. Um, and, and taking the position that if you hadn't left the subtenant, I wouldn't be stuck with this. Um, and that's what I would do. And so that and, and that conversation can happen before uh, February 1st. Obviously, we can begin to talk with master tenants to figure out if they're going to be helpful to us in figuring out how to get them out, uh, how to get their former subtenant out. OK, um, there's a there's a question um, being asked. Can a landlord charge late fee for late payments? And I think the question is assuming that the late payment fee is not already in a written lease. Yeah. So uh, if so, obviously, if the late fee is written into the form lease and and has the standard liquidated damages uh, provision language that we expect, um, then, yeah, that's there's it's it's enforceable so long as the number, the dollar amount is not unreasonable. Um, if you haven't, if you don't have a written lease, then you're not going to be able to charge late fees. We could serve a 30-day notice imposing late fees, but we're not allowed to. Um, we're not allowed to enforce it by eviction. We can't say, "Well, you failed to pay the late fees, so here's a three-day notice, and we're going to evict you." That's one of the changes that happened several, many, many, many years ago, um, where uh, the rent ordinance says that we cannot uh, change terms of tenancy. Uh, in which they're enforceable by eviction. So typically what we use that right to do to change terms is to remove stuff. Like, for instance, if you have a really old lease that has an attorney's fees clause, we often will remove the attorney's fees clause because as a practical matter, it only goes one way. It, it, it only uh, if we win, then we're never going to collect it from the from the tenant because they have no money. But if we lose, the tenant will be able to collect it from us. Any other questions? At the moment, those are all the questions coming in through the chat or the Q&A. OK, so, well, I think if you have more questions, please let me know. But in the meantime, let me just um, tell you what I expect to see. Um, so as I said, one thing is I expect that there may be an additional moratorium as uh, locally. Um, uh, uh, the one that's going to pass is going to leave us out to March 31st. Um, 
and it's interesting what the city has done is that they have relied upon local police power to implement this moratorium and there is a very strong question as to whether that is proper there had been uh, as you may know dean preston passed an initial moratorium locally um uh, that the San Francisco Association of Realtors, among others, challenged. Um, we got a very bad decision uh, at the trial court level that the, the trial court judge, Judge Haynes, um, said that it was proper, that the local police power was sufficient. Um, we sought to appeal it, uh, but we got a very bad panel. Um, and so um, the, the, the wisdom of, of our, our sister organization as us was to drop the appeal because we were very worried about getting bad law set in precedent. Um, but I think for that reason, um, I'm cons- uh, I don't believe we're going to challenge this latest uh, passage of this ordinance. At least nobody's consulted me about it. Um, and if we don't, then my question in my head is what's going to stop Dean Preston from saying, you know what, um, I got past phase one where I, I prevented evictions for non-payment of rent. I got past phase two uh, now that I've stopped evictions, any kind of eviction basically except Ellis Act uh, through March 31st. What if I just passed something that says you can't do evictions? You know, that's just going to be a risk you're going to have. And I'm going to use the same police power that I think we have and I have the votes to do it. What will happen? Um, well, obviously it'll be challenged, but you know it's a concern, and it's going to throw everything into turmoil. Uh, it'll make very doubtful why landlords would ever even rent to somebody, because <laughs> the minute they hand them the keys, they're just going to stop paying rent. Uh, I mean, who wouldn't? Um, so anyway, that's kind of what I'm really worried about um, seeing, um, and. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised if we see uh, Supervisor Preston uh, pass that. And so why? So uh, that kind of reminds me to remind all of you that if you haven't already voted, particularly locally for your supervisors, there's a couple of very uh, important races, um, uh, District 1, uh, Marjan uh, Philhauer, very important that we get her on. She's a, a, a moderate. Um, there are things that we have to worry about. And so... Um, we have to keep our eye on the ball. Okay, Jeff, there's a couple more questions coming in. Um, with counties outside of San Francisco that have removed the eviction moratorium, mm-hmm. have you experienced uh, any landlords being able to collect back rent successfully in small cl- So, no, because the local eviction moratoriums um, – while they're gone, there still is a statewide non-payment of rent eviction moratorium. Um, and so they that law, that state law preempts local law. So it doesn't matter what local law says. And in fact, that's why San Francisco's eviction moratorium excludes non-payment of rent because it would it would run afoul of the local ordinance, uh, excuse me, the statewide ordinance. And so the statewide ordinance says that you cannot begin a civil action for non-payment of rent for any rent due between March 1st and January 31st until February 1st. That's um, and that's the rule. So no, we haven't seen it. We won't see it until uh, February 1st. So why do you think Ellis Act was not included in the moratorium on evictions in San Francisco? I believe specifically. Yeah. Well, um, that's because the Ellis Act is a state law. Um, and so I'm, I'm sure that the, the, the authors of the bill were concerned that that would give a very strong basis for a challenge, uh, to evict because, uh, uh, under the concept of preemption, which is the, that the state law preempts local law. Um, and I think probably that would have been successful. And so they just figured an Ellis Act is already, um, going to take a year to do anyway. Um, in most cases, because somebody will claim protected status. Uh, and if not, it's four months. And so extending, uh, doing a moratorium on the Ellis Act so that you can't start one uh, um, until after um, March 31st really doesn't do much, uh, doesn't protect them much. 
uh, if at all. And so why take the risk of, uh, of getting it overturned under the theory of preemption as to the Ellis Act? And so that's probably why it was done that way. Anybody have any other questions that I can answer? Um, there's a question coming in. Um, it's it's a little, I'm trying to make sense of it. There's a, maybe I'll just read it from the beginning of the conversation. Sure. Um, there's a two unit property with one protected tenant and the other's been there for years, both paying very low rent. Um, the protected tenant also has a home out of state. What can you do? The buyer wants to move into one of the units. Is it possible to raise the rent on the other tenant? I believe in the other unit is the question. Uh, the buyer would like to move into the unit that the protected tenant lives in. Ah. Um, yeah. Um, well, hopefully the buyer bought this property for really, really cheap because it's going to be uh, a challenge. Um, so if doing an owner move in, uh, you're only going to be able to take the unit with the unprotected tenant in it. Um, even under, even doing what we had called, what I told you about the um, the Swinar challenge, the constitutional challenge. Um, what what it one of the things that's required you to show is that there was no available unit with an unprotected tenant, and so we're not going to see that um, happen. We're not going to we're not going to be able to use Swinar to get them out. And um, uh, and so if you want the, um, to get the unit, you're going to have to probably Ellisack the building if you can't buy out the tenant. Um, uh, and if the tenant won't go, the tenant won't be bought out, then we'll have to do an Ellisack, which will mean that we'll have to clear the whole building. And then the question will be, what can you use the second unit for that you didn't want to live in? You want to live in one. Uh, what could you do with the second one? Well, you could sell it as a TIC it would have lost all its condo rights if we didn't buy out the protected tenant. Um, that's possible. Um, how would we get the tenant? Uh, we would have already gotten that tenant out. So if we were to buy out the top tenant, the one that you, the unit you really wanted and you want it, uh, then someone could do an owner moving downstairs. That may be possible. Um, but that's, um, that's a difficult property. And that's why I think I can see from the comments that it was sold for, for fairly cheap um, that, that's why that property would have uh, some significant challenges in terms of pricing, because um, if that tenant were to excuse me, if that owner were to come to me, um, I would tell them that they should budget 100 grand per unit to deal with it. Um, it might end up costing less than half that amount. You just never know. But if you want to budget that, you know, that's what you should budget. And if it's an Ellis Act, then we're look, talking about budgeting 200 grand to deal with it, both tenants in that building. Um, I think we have time for one, possibly two more questions. Great. So, are, are you seeing more of your clients cashing out of the rental business in San Francisco? And what was the last straw for them? <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, it's funny. Um, I mean, there are two types of landlords that I work with primarily. One are people who have held a long time. And then there are people that are more, much, much, much more recent. It's not, not a lot in between. So the long-term landlords, um, you are seeing some of them cash out, but sometimes them, their basis is, are so low that they just they, they they can suffer the slings and arrows. The, the buyers that are more recent, the last several years, um, I am seeing uh, them sort of abandoning. But a lot of those buyers, uh, you know, it's it may or may not be due to the changing of the laws. Uh, it may be because uh, of COVID, they feel that they can do all their work, you know, from Arizona and they want to cash out. That that could be some of the reasons I've seen. Uh, some of it are family circumstances change. And then then some of it is that uh, they can't they can't stand the laws anymore. But I have to say that for the vast majority of people that I meet for the first time who I start talking to them about tenant problems, there's a lot of ignorance out there. And so while all of you are, you know, are keep up and are fairly well educated as to what the laws are in San Francisco, at least to know that they exist, a lot of landlords don't even know that. They don't even know how much risk that they're bearing uh, 
in terms of the way they're operating and, and, and so forth. So, um, so I haven't seen a flood of, of people selling yet. Um, I know it'd be great for all of, all of you uh, if they would all sell, but it hasn't quite happened yet. <laughs> okay. Um, one more question. This is a uh, changing uh, directions just a little bit. Um, the question is about converting a four unit, I believe it's a four unit property into TICs. What's the approximate uh, fees that they can expect legal fees? Yeah, I, I'm so sorry uh, that I can't really answer this question because I don't do this kind of work. Um, this is kind of specialized work and, and there are a lot of, uh, not a lot, there's a handful of really good TIC lawyers, um, you know, I work a lot with Andy Serkin, but there are others. There's the uh, um, um, there's the uh, Goldstein Gelman firm. There's um, uh, Lisa. What am I? Can't think of Lisa's last name for a second. But anyway, th there are a number of very good tenant, uh, excuse me, TIC lawyers. But I will say that right now, unless you are in the expedited uh, conversion, you know, which passed about uh, six years ago. Uh, where you were already um, have had applied and lost for condo conversion, that there is no conversion of four unit buildings uh, into condos anymore. Um, you would have to win the lottery and the lottery has been suspended, as I said, till 2024. And um, I guess it depends on who is on the board of supervisors and who's the mayor in 2024. But um, it may never come back. We may never see it again. So, um you know, so the price may be infinite to convert a TIC into a, a, a condo. Um, now, I'm sorry, if the question is not TICs, but uh, in, into condos, but into TICs, that's simply done by um, preparing uh, a TIC agreement. Nothing more than that has to happen with a four unit building. You don't have to go to the, uh, the state to have something registered. Um, you don't need a white paper. You can just um, you can just create a TIC through a TIC agreement. And I, I suggest that you call one of the very, very good TIC lawyers. They usually have package deals. So hopefully that helps. Okay. All right. So thank you all so much. I really appreciate your participation and all your great questions. Um, in the chat, in the very beginning, I left my email address. So if you have follow-up questions, please feel free to get in touch with me. It's, it's, it's great to see you all. And, uh, you know, I wish you uh, good health and, and, and hope you guys get some business. All right. Take care. Thanks.